Well, of course, the first thing we have to do is draw a Minkowski diagram. A Minkowski diagram, yes, of course. How silly of me. First, let's draw a grid of the three dimensions of space. Up and down, left and right, and forward and back. Okay, stop there. Now, our three dimensions are caught at a point in time, namely our single frame of film. Okay. Now, if you would, move the film on a couple of frames, and to simplify things, we'll take away the dimensions of depth and up and down. Okay. Hold it there for a moment. Right. What we're left with is a single dimension of space frozen on our stationary frame of film. Now, let's draw onto this single frame of film a direction of time from bottom to top, and a point which lives its life entirely confined to this one dimension. It only ever moves to the left or right, in other words. Now, if you start the machine, joining up the frames of film, the instance of time, then you can see what our twinkling point is up to. Mathematicians call the track it's leaving, as it weaves back and forth, a world line, tracing out our point's life history, so to speak. Its birth, where it went in space, and when it died. This way of looking at events is extremely useful to mathematicians, who usually draw the diagram something like this. The vertical line is still the direction of time. The horizontal line, still space. These radiating lines represent the tracks of the fastest things in the universe, namely light beams. And so they're called light lines. Their crossing point is the present, the now. It looks like an hourglass. Yes, there are some strong similarities. Ahead of the now is a region called the absolute future, like the sand in the hourglass that's yet to fall. Behind the now is a region called the absolute past, equivalent of the sand that's already fallen. To either side, there is a region of space and time about which, for the moment, nothing at all can be known, called the absolute elsewhere. The absolute elsewhere? Yes. Totally inaccessible to anyone experiencing a now, since not even light can reach them from out there, until sometime in their future, further along their world line, in other words. What about free will, though? Now, you'll see. All in good time. Oh, go on a bit more. Let's make this your world line from birth to some time in your future. According to Einstein and others, time simply is. It doesn't flow. You're the one that experiences the motion through time. It's moving. Well, that's right. It's your now. Your consciousness of the present moving along your world line, discovering new aspects of your life as you come upon them. Some people believe that the bit of your world line that extends into the future is already there, and that things don't happen to you, you happen to them, simply stumbling into them, in the dark, so to speak. But that seems to imply that uh, I'm not free to choose my own fate. That's right, it does. Of course, many people disagree with this view of our lives. Some people think that there's an almost infinite variety of futures available to us at each now and that we're free to choose any one of them. But in fact, since there's no way of proving which of you is the right one, and so long as we believe ourselves to be free, what difference does it make? And the only thing we can't change is how quickly we reach the end of our world lines. I don't like the sound of that. Can't I stop it? No. Slow down a bit. Sorry. Stupid machine. Now, now. 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 What does that word now really mean? You might say that it describes the gap between the future and the past. And yet those Minkowski diagrams imply that the now is infinitely short. If it is, then time must be continuous. But what if time were discontinuous? What if there were particles of time, like the grains of sand in this hourglass, each of which couldn't be split up any further? If that were the case, then each particle would represent the smallest moment possible. A uh, now, in other words. Some theoretical physicists think that's the way time is. Dr. David Finkelstein.
The main thing to remember is that while time may be very hard to talk about, it's not itself a hard thing, like a piece of flint, like this. Time is the relation between things that happen. If you like, time is just one damn thing after another. As soon as we learned that electricity came in bits, and energy came in bits, we began wondering whether time did too, and space. And these bits were called chronons. These bits too aren't material objects. They've got to be events, happenings, the things of which time is made, like the sun going down. The question of whether they exist is a question of whether the things that go on in the world are a steady stream that can be cut anywhere we like, or whether, in a sense, God too has an hourglass with grains of sand in it that fall one by one. I don't think most people realize how far physics is from a theory of the world. I think people trust physicists too much. There has never been a theory of the world. Newton didn't have one. He had at best a doctrine. Find the forces was his doctrine, and you'll understand everything. Today we have a doctrine of elementary particles. The characteristic time for elementary particles is around 10 to the minus 23 seconds. This is roughly the time it takes light to cross a particle at rest. If the chronon were that big, then it would be important for the structure of elementary particles, matter, and the rest of the universe. I'm hoping that that's about where the answer is, and that the bewildering variety of particles we've been discovering recently is just a reflection of the different ways in which elementary processes weave together. The very question of the continuity of nature has been with us as long as people have worried about time at all. Heraclitus said that time is as a child playing checkers. Zeno, five centuries before Christ, raised the following paradox. Let's get my old friend the flint back again. Zeno considered the following experiment. We drop it, it hits the ground, and he proved that couldn't happen. Because in order to reach the ground, first it has to fall halfway. Then it has to fall half the remaining distance. Then half the remaining distance. Then half the remaining distance. If you can always cut the distance that remains in half, it seemed to him it took an infinite number of acts before it could reach the ground. How can you carry out an infinite number of acts in a finite time? Therefore, it never reaches the ground. It's an infinite sequence that never terminates. We are all immobile, according to this argument of Zeno. Before we can move any distance, we must move half that distance, and so on. Lord Russell, back about the beginning of the century, used the movies to convince himself that just because life looks continuous is no reason to suppose that it actually is because the movies too are one frame after another and yet give this illusion of continuity. The main question is if there are chronons, if there are frames in the world motion picture, how many frames per second is the show going on at?